All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Martin Husseva. I'm a social professor here at the law school. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, here today for another uh, Bill Cornish Memorial Lecture, as you might know. Uh, last year, we had our inaugural uh, Bill Cornish Memorial Lecture, which was delivered by uh, Professor Jane Ginsburg. And um, as we have explained last year, uh, the series has been established to honor late Professor Bill Cornish, uh, who you all uh, know very well. Um, Professor Bill Cornish was a giant of intellectual property law, he has inspired many people to study intellectual property law um, and take up careers in this domain. Actually, our, uh, our today's speaker um, is a evidence of, of that uh, as well. Um, the reason why we established this lecture series is because we thought um, it's important to honor um, Professor Cornish's contribution, also to LSE. Um, he spent over almost 30 years here at LSE before he went to uh, move to Cambridge um, to take the inaugural um, chair as a Herschel Smith Professor of Intellectual Property Law. Uh, I won't recount all of his achievements. You are all familiar uh, with his work and uh, with him. Um, and our today's speaker will engage uh, with uh, Bill's ideas um, in any case. Uh, the only thing I would like to say before I hand over to Luke uh, to introduce our today's speaker is, um, Cambridge University, is that Cambridge University set up um, a memorial fund uh, to support doctoral research in the area of intellectual property law. And they've been collecting uh, money to support uh, the uh, endowed studentship uh, since 2022. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in contributing or know someone who could be interested in contributing, uh, I highly encourage you to uh, look up on the, on the Cambridge University website um, and, and contribute. Um, so I guess that's all what I have to say. I'm, um, I'm very happy to, to see uh, many familiar faces and to see many familiar faces again. So uh, it seems like you're coming back, which is a good sign, I hope. Uh, recurring customers are always a good thing, Luke. So, um, so we're privileged to have you and uh, privileged to have our today's speaker. And yeah, I'll hand over to Luke, who did all the work. I did nothing, really. Uh, so Luke, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so as, as Martin said, uh, last year we set up this lecture series as an annual event, uh, really the highlight of the IP calendar here at LSE. Um, we've been kind of taking it in turns at doing the organization. So Martin did a lot of uh, the legwork last year to bring Professor Ginsburg, and I've taken it on for this year. Um, but it's really a pleasure to, to do this because one of the things that we've been doing at LSE since Professor Cornish passed away is kind of recognizing his contribution, but also how variegated that contribution is. There are students of Professor Cornish in this room who have gone on to be professors, who have gone on to um, you know, influence countless other people in the field. So we're um, very honored to be kind of a part of that, uh, that influence here at LSE and sharing that with Cambridge is, is very important to us. And last year, we were able to mark this series with one of um, Bill Cornish's very close friends and colleagues, Jane Ginsburg, uh, whose husband used to play music with Bill uh, when they would socialize in New York and Cambridge. And this year, we are absolutely delighted to have a former student of Bill's, Professor Caroline Nkube. Um, and Professor Nkube's work has been very inspirational to me uh, personally, but I know is recognized internationally. She's advised WIPO in the African Union. She currently holds the South Africa Research Chair in Intellectual Property, Innovation and Development at the University of Cape Town. And it's particularly fortuitous that she's giving this lecture in 2024, because as we will see in uh, Professor Nkube's lecture, 20 years ago, um, Professor Cornish published a lecture series organized by Professor David Weber, who's joining us online this evening, um, on this title. And so we're incredibly privileged to, two decades later, 
maybe a generation of IP scholarship later to have invited someone as uh, respected and erudite as Caroline to reflect upon what all of that means 20 years on and where we are as a subject. You know, where are, where are we now, where have we been, and where are we going? So without further ado, I'll hand over to, to Caroline and I'll ask you to approach the podium so that we can enjoy the 2024 Bill Cornish Lecture. So you'll join me in my Um, so thank you very much uh, for that warm introduction, Luke, and thank you for having me uh, to both Martin and Luke. Um, I also wanted to start with a series of thanks, really. Um, first of all, to say thank you to everyone in the room uh, for coming to join us today. I mean, time is so precious and you have so many options yet you chose to join us this evening. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to extend the same word of thanks um, to those who are joining us um, online. Um, so I know family, friends, and colleagues are on there. Um, I've brought my phone with me because I say to someone, if I do anything funny, text me. Um, so <laughs> maybe um, I will get a text. Um, so there's a lot to say and so little time. I shall try to pace myself, um, but perhaps I may have to leave um, certain things out. So to start with um, the man we're honoring today, um, there are so many wonderful tributes and accounts um, of the work that Professor Cornish has done, and I know many in the room um, know him very well. So what I'm going to do is simply to write on what has been written and said about Professor Cornish, and I will start the story where and when I met him, um, because that's the only place I can start, I can imagine. Um, I'm sure you all know that in the latter part of his career, uh, Professor Cornish was the Heschel Smith Professor of Intellectual Property Law at Cambridge University from 1995 <laughs> to 2004. So I met him right bang in the middle of that time of his life. Um, in 1994, uh, 1999, I took his LLM course in intellectual property. And um, I could say so much about meeting him then, so I'll try and, and contain myself. I have this favorite story that I tell everyone about Professor Cornish. And that is to say that when I went to Cambridge, I actually went there hoping to become, intending to become a hardcore corporate lawyer who was just going to do corporate governance, corporate finance, and company law. And because we had the option of doing a fourth course, I thought the fourth course is going to be my wild card. I'm going to pick something exciting, something new, something exciting. Um, and so when I got there and I had to choose my fourth course, I don't know why, but I picked Professor Cornish's intellectual property law uh, course. And that was it, like I was completely um, done for. Um, and so that wild card actually turned out to be my destiny. And so when Luke first invited me to give this talk, um, I thought I might entitle it of wild cards and destiny. That was my initial topic. Um, I then thought, okay, I'll, I'll keep it aside and I'll use that to introduce um, the talk. And so, um, what to say about Professor Cornish? Um, um, there, there is so much, and I, one could say that um, he's shaped my destiny in so many ways. Um, the way in which he imparted knowledge about intellectual property law um, has actually turned me out to be the kind of um, academic that I am. Um, and so I thought, you know, three is a great number. Maybe three things about uh, what I learned from Professor Cornish. So the first of all is that he actually taught uh, intellectual property law in a very comprehensive and contextual way. So whilst he took the time to teach us about the technical stuff, you know, the, the requirements for protection, he also made sure to challenge us uh, with questions like, um, you know, what is the purpose of patent law? Um, who decides patent policy? How much weight should we give to stakeholders or lobbyists when we're making laws? And so that was really important. Um, the next thing that he did was really to make sure 
that we understood how law and policy were made in this area of law. And so he really focused on the international institutions. And one thing he did for us as a group was to take us to Geneva, to WIPO. I believe it was in 1999. What fun that was, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can recall getting onto an easy jet. I can recall the crummy youth hostel we slept in. Stories galore, but I will not bore you with the stories. Uh, and of course, we were so impressed uh, with WIPO itself when we got there. Um, and so that was really important for him to take us um, to the heart or to the center of norm setting um, at that early stage of our careers. And that has always um, enabled me, caused me to always go back to the heart and question um, the, the institutions that are responsible for norm setting. And then the third thing that uh, Professor Cornish did for, for many others, and myself in particular, was to continue post our studies as a very kind and considerate mentor and supporter. And so back then in 99, when we went to, to WIPO, um, I didn't have a fancy camera. I actually don't have any pictures um, of that time. Uh, what I do have is a picture uh, where the only picture I have when I'm in the same frame as Professor Cornish. And just to make sure you can see me, I wore exactly the same outfit. <laughs> so if you're eagle-eyed, you will see me there in the same outfit. Um, it's somewhat smaller, but it's still the same outfit <laughs> 20 years later. Um, and so uh, it was in 2015 and 2013 that I last saw Professor Cornish um, at the age of Congresses, first uh, at Oxford and then at the Cape Town one. And um, it was really good um, to see him there. So, um, I, like all who knew him, were, was very saddened by his passing, um, and we remain grateful that his scholarship has inspired us. And I'm going to talk a bit about the ways in which his scholarship um, has influenced me going, to get, uh, going forward. Um, it is a really rare privilege to be asked to come and give a lecture today after the inspirational lecture given by Professor Ginsberg um, last year. So moving on then to the questions that he posed in 2004 that I want to use for today's talk. So you know that in 2002, he gave these three lectures. They were an hour long each, so he had three hours to talk about these topics. And then later on, um, the book was published uh, by Oxford University Press. And you know, I thought I'd bring it along with me. Um, so what does he say in that book? Quite a lot, uh, if I may say. Um, but I wanted to, to just use his metaphor that he used uh, for intellectual property. And so the first thing that one might say about that metaphor is that it's not a really pleasant one. Um, he uses the metaphor of an unpleasant skin condition, actually, to explain uh, intellectual property. So he talks about intellectual property rights that are omnipresent, um, that he says are spreading like a rash across new technologies and leaving very few patches of unblemished open skin. Uh, the second kind of intellectual property rights that he talks about are those that are distracting, um, those that achieve little of their essential purpose but cause persistent itching. And the third type of intellectual property rights that he talks about are those that have become irrelevant because you know uh, technology uh, makes them uh, irrelevant or negative. So those are the three uh, things that he uses, the, the metaphors, and the way in which he uh, organizes his ideas is in three broad topics. He talks about inventing and wrote about inventing, then creating, and finally branding. Um, the book is quite comprehensive. If you look at it, um, it has about 12 to 14 subheadings under those three main uh, topics. So inventing really focuses on patents, creating its copyright, and branding its, its trademarks. Um, what it does when I read through the lecture the lectures uh, is that with each kind of intellectual property right, um, he does at least six things. So he sets out the technical requirements for protection, um, and then he talks about the typical commercialization of those rights. Uh, and like the thorough scholar that he was, he also talks about the theories that should inform our evaluation and assessment um, of those rights. And then he goes on to speak about infringement and permissible uses, and of course, the policy questions he raises them. So he asks, for instance, uh, is copyright going to become irrelevant? And as always, he talks as well about the impact of technology. Now, the topics when he was speaking them at that time, um, they were very topical. Um, he talks about Napster, which was the big thing then, the challenges that Napster wrote. Um, and actually, his scholarship at that time fell very much in line with what many other scholars were writing about. So uh, across the pond in the US, um, uh, Lawrence Lessig was writing about technology, 
um, he published Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace in 1999. So I suppose what I want to say is that at that moment he was writing at um, the very um, cutting edge of technology. And under the inventing um, topic, he spent a lot of time speaking about medical patents, gene patents, um, and so the point is that he spoke about uh, the latest technological advances. So to just go back to those three touch words, if you like, that he used, um, when he discussed copyright, like I said earlier on, he posed the question whether copyright might become irrelevant because there were so many changes, technological changes, that were changing the way in which materials were being produced, distributed, and accessed. Um, 20 years later, I think we can confidently say that copyright has not become irrelevant. It has been shaken, perhaps to its core, uh, but it still stands. Um, and um, even though we have a lot of technological advancement, um, I don't think that they ha it has completely rendered intellectual property irrelevant. And so maybe just two examples of areas where we have a lot of technological um, advancement. So for example, if we think about uh, computing technologies, we know that for quite a long time now we've been engrossed in conversations about AI, um, AI-generated works. We spend a lot of time talking about the input questions, the training materials, is the infringement when they're used, how, do we, how should consent be obtained, how should the right holders be um, compensated, for example. Another area um, away from copyright, perhaps, um, is to think about um, when we ask questions about inventorship, so perhaps the things that are being generated could possibly be the subject of patent protection, but we ask the question, can AI ever be an inventor? Um, if we look perhaps in the health context, we know that prosthetics um, are quite important uh, and are used extensively. Now we have 3D printing of prosthetics, and there, there are also a lot of intellectual property questions. Um, patents are used, copyright, design rights, um, and so on. So Professor Conch's work then was at the cutting edge of technology. Um, it was informed by his own very impressive decades uh, worth of, of work. And so his work is really interesting. You see it in evidence, of course, in his published works, but you also see it in evidence uh, in relation to his teaching, what he taught, and also the kinds of conferences that he sponsored and was part of. So I thought I'd pick this one. This was a really interesting uh, conference that was held in 2001, so a year prior to the Clarendon Lectures. Uh, this conference was on um, ownership uh, in the digital economy. It was really interesting. When you look at the list of the organizing team, um, it included <coughs> computer, science, uh, computer scientists, political um, scholars, political science scholars, and how on earth did I find out about this? I found out about this because when I traveled um, last month um, to, to Cambridge, I met Professor Alan Blackwell, and then I told him about this lecture, and he said, oh, Bill was my friend, and Bill and I were working on this conference, and then he shared those materials with me. And I thought it was really interesting. And I thought I'd mention that, um, I thought I'd mention that Professor Cornish um, extended himself beyond legal scholarship. He uh, cooperated with others, organized conferences with others in other fields, which is really, really important, and I think made him the kind of scholar um, that he was. Um, we, of course, I think all of us know that he was also an historian and uh, an expert in English law, and he brought all of that together um, in his work. Um, I've chosen, like I've said earlier, to go with the 2004 text, <coughs> and what I thought I'd do is perhaps follow the, the thread of thoughts that he started in 2004 and see how he drew them out um, throughout the rest of his career. And so I came across a, a chapter that he co-authored with Professor Kathleen Liddell, in 2016, and in that text, I found that he surfaced many of the questions and the issues about developing context. And so I'm going to be really using these two works, the 2004 <coughs> book and the 2016 text um, to frame my thoughts this evening. So it's really good to start with Professor Cornish's framing, that uh, intractable skin condition metaphor that he uses but I thought that I'd give it a little spin of my own. And I thought I'd spin it by using one of my favorite books of all time. And this is a book called Nervous Conditions by a Zimbabwean author called Tsitsi Tangarenda. And right at the start of that book, uh, on the fly page, she's just got a quote um, from Fanon that says, the condition of native is a nervous condition. And so I thought, <coughs> marry the two. So borrowing from Cornish and Tangarenda, 
um, I wanted to, to leverage this point that when confronted with intellectual property, the condition of less resourced context is a nervous condition. So I'm going with the framing of a condition, but I'm choosing it to be a nervous condition. And why would I characterize this condition um, as a nervous one? I would characterize it as a nervous condition because um, we know um, that access to intellectual property protected was really, you can correlate it directly to the income status of a country. And we only need to look back like two years to the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and ask questions about who could access um, the necessary vaccines and other medical technologies. And this map shows us very starkly um, that it depended on the <coughs> income status. And so, you know, I would say that developing or less resourced contexts are nervous because intellectual property continues to be omnipresent. It is relevant, but yet it is distracting because it gets in the way of actual access um, to the necessary technologies. And so that would, um, that's where I'm going to build from. Um, and so 20 years later, <coughs> after Komsh um, framed that metaphor. Have things changed? Um, I'll give away my gambit and say, I think 20 years later, we haven't really moved from where we were then. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The context has changed. The technological advances are different, but I think very much the approach that the world has um, towards intellectual property remains the same. So again, if we look at the last few years, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, intellectual property was omnipresent, it was relevant, it was distracting, um, and it wasn't just patents, it was the whole range of intellectual property rights, but more of that later. And if we look into the foreseeable future, uh, what is awaiting us, and some would argue that we already are in the poly crisis, but we know that with um, climate change, we know that with conflict, um, that the challenges that we had previously would only be um, accelerated or exaggerated. And so um, when we discuss intellectual property, then out of perhaps an appreciation that it continues to be relevant, to be omnipresent, that sometimes often it stands in the way of equitable access, um, the scholarship now tends to move towards trying to frame intellectual property discussions differently so that perhaps we might get a different outcome. So a lot of the current scholarship um, focuses on social, uh, on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, also look to human rights in a bid to try and shift the way in which we think about intellectual property. And so I just thought I'd talk a bit about uh, this volume that I had the privilege to co-edit with uh, Bita Mani and Matthew Rimmer um, that has more than 30 authors um, looking at the whole range of the SDGs 17 of them and how they interact with intellectual property. And I think it would be fair of me to say that collectively these 30 plus authors um, would argue um, that intellectual property um, as currently configured does not yet provide an environment in which we can advance the SDGs and fully, fully uh, protect and promote um, the human rights of people. But again, more of that later. So I want you to go back to the debates that raged during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and that are still continuing now. And um, so questions like, what is the essential purpose of, it, of intellectual property rights? So when they are granted, what is the social deal um, that is being brokered? Um, is it to get uh, public welfare in so that people have access to essential medical technologies? Um, what is that uh, essential function that we're looking for? Uh, when we grant intellectual property rights, do we drive further innovation? That is also one of the ways in which the social construct is often um, justified. And so in the context then of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, questions uh, were asked, did IP actually drive innovation? Um, some would argue that not really, because um, a lot of this innovation was predicated on public funding through procurement um, and other means of publicly funding the research. Um, the experience uh, of many in the developing world was that intellectual property limited and delayed access to life-saving medical technology. And so it is not too large a jump from that perspective 
to say that the current normative um, framework actually does not deliver um, the goods that we are looking for, the outcomes, the public welfare outcomes that we're looking for. And so as a result of the appreciation of that, uh, we had the TRIPS waiver proposal at the WTO, uh, which was fronted by South Africa and India, and had significant um, global support, but also equally significant opposition from a few countries. Um, that TRIPS waiver proposal um, did not see the light of day in its broad conceptualization. A much narrower um, outcome was delivered, um, through the uh, MC12 declaration on COVID-19 and the ministerial decision. Um, and what those two instruments did, what the waiver was, was simply to limit it to vaccines, not therapeutics and diagnostics, just vaccines, um, and then only to patent law. And it has some reach uh, as regards clinical data protection. Uh, but that's all that <coughs> was reached in June 2002. Um, there was then an undertaking that the rest of the proposal is it extended to therapeutics and diagnostics and other intellectual property rights would be handled and decided upon within six months. That would have been 17 December 2002. Um, that deadline was not met and there are ongoing discussions and the matter remains live um, to this day. So what then happened was having only achieved so much internationally at the global stage, um, states then retreated to see what they could do domestically or within their trading blocks. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the national changes. Um, suffice it to say that um, there have been notifications of what states have done, and if you go onto the World um, Trade Organization's website, you can find um, some of this detail. I'm going to speak a bit more about the regional efforts to show you what has been happening within trading blocks within the African continental free trade area and also within the EU, but I'll come back to that later. Um, another massive global effort which is really important would be the ongoing negotiations in relation to the WHO pandemic abroad. What I really wanted to, to focus on uh, is that in these various reform attempts, proposals, that there are two arguments that come up over and over again, and these are the twin arguments of manufacturing capacity and trips flexibilities. Um, and so in an earlier iteration um, of my slides, perhaps the one that I sent to Uma and, and Luke, I know at one point I'd actually put in brackets terrible twins, and then I thought, no, let me take it off. Um, and so I did. But I wanted to talk a bit about those arguments because they actually impact how um, the globe is proceeding when it comes to reconfiguring intellectual property. So the first argument then, the manufacturing capacity um, argument is this. It goes along these lines. Intellectual property is not really the problem. We don't have to change IP norms as we know them and experience them. <coughs> the problem is actually manufacturing capacity which is limited or non-existent in many parts of the world. This, this is the argument. Um, this argument, I think, has been debunked to a, a significant extent. Um, first of all, even though manufacturing capacity is limited and non-existent in many parts of the world, there are pockets of manufacturing capacity in various parts of the developing world. So there are several African countries that have this. There are countries uh, in Asia that are able to do the work. Um, and so that's one. <coughs> the second then is to say, um, if intellect, the argument went like this, if intellectual property is not the problem, it's manufacturing capacity, we can fix it, we can fix it because we will share um, our intellectual property and we will invest in manufacturing capacity voluntarily. The bitter, bitter experience of the last three years is that neither of those promises have been kept. So um, the WHO tried to improve manufacturing capacity came up with the mRNA technology transfer program um, that has a hub to serve Africa and other countries in South Africa. Um, and that hub, one would have expected, would have been given access to the IP um, that they needed to develop the vaccine. Uh, but one would be bitterly disappointed because they did not get um, access, despite there having been a pledge made uh, along the lines of we're going to allow 92 um, low and middle income countries to actually use our IP and we would not sue. This was a pledge from Moderna. 
but we know that from experience, um, the hub in South Africa was not given any access, and so they had to start from scratch, and they uh, report that they used a process called forward integration, rather than reverse engineering, um, to actually come up with their own vaccine. Um, they did eventually come up with their own vaccine, but after a very long period of time, and so um, my very strong sense is that if the intellectual property had been shared with them, they would have gotten a result much quicker, more efficiently, and perhaps delivered uh, the vaccine to any and save lives in that sense. Um, so that is the sharing of IP. Uh, what about the second uh, commitment, and that would be to build manufacturing capacity on the continent and elsewhere in developing contexts? Um, that also seems to have <coughs> now lost momentum. For example, there was a, a pledge or a plan to build a, a hub in Kenya, but it was reported some three weeks or two weeks ago that that would not be uh, proceeding as well. And so um, the Africa CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, actually put out uh, quite a curt press uh, statement uh, in relation to that, just saying that they were very disappointed that this voluntary um, contribution to building manufacturing capacity um, had then not been um, carried forward. So that's the manufacturing capacity argument. The twin argument would be you don't need more. We don't need to reform intellectual property norms as we know them because they're good as they are. Um, you've got flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement which states should use um, to their benefit. So because our time is limited, unlike Professor Cornish, I don't have three hours um, to share my thoughts. Uh, I'm really not going to um, explain the flexibilities, but just looking across the room, I can see that um, I would not need to, um, many of us have written about the flexibilities. And so all I suppose I can say would be to say, when we look at Professor Cornish's work, he really emphasized how intellectual property rights impacted um, access to medical technologies. And so in 2004, uh, he commented that patents had been blamed or were responsible um, for the lack of access um, to for people who had HIV AIDS. Um, and <coughs> we, I will talk about that. I'll talk about the famous South African case uh, in a few minutes. And then in 2006, he returned um, to that same line of thinking. And in this context, um, in this volume, the first part of the volume um, actually had a chapter from Professor Cornish and Professor Little where they talked about the TRIPS agreement. They do this tour de force of uh, patent law, of intellectual property law. They say what the TRIPS agreement um, achieved. They pay attention to patents, to clinical trial data, and then they talk about this context about intellectual property um, cannot be like one size fits all. There needs to be a configuration or nuancing to cater for the different socio-economic contexts. And so that chapter then talks about the battle of interests, if you will, between well-resourced and less resourced contexts. Um, talks about how the public interest is important. Um, they talk about Article 7 and Article 8 of the TRIPS agreement. And then finally, they get to the trust flexibilities and explain them in quite a lot of detail. Um, like I said, I won't be doing that this evening. I've simply just listed them um, on those slides that you can see. So, for example, for less developing countries, there are the transition periods um, that give them leeway and policy space to not have to uh, comply with all of the TRIPS agreement, say for a few um, provisions right at the beginning. Um, then compulsory licensing is key, parallel importation, the BOLA provision, and exceptions for patentability. I suppose the best way or the fairest way in the limited time that I have available to explain this would be simply to say that in the TRIPS agreement there are inbuilt public interest mechanisms that would allow states to do certain things in order to allow access um, to protected um, inventions. What's also really interesting in this 2016 chapter um, for purposes of this talk um, is how Professor Cornish and Professor Little actually talk about the trade and political pressure that is brought to be um, on countries who want to leverage the trade flexibilities. So remember the argument would be we don't need to change um, the intellectual property framework as it stands because there are already inbuilt public interest mechanisms which states should use and they will be fine. I'm putting it crudely, but that's, that's one way of um, thinking about that argument. Uh, Professor Cornish and Liesl say, well, 
hold on a minute, not so fast, it's not really that simple. Although these public interest mechanisms exist, um, experience has been that it's been quite difficult for states to actually domesticate them and put them in their national laws and beyond that to actually use them um, to maximum effect. And the reasons uh, for that are manifold. Um, the examples of the trade and political pressure that is applied uh, are many. I'll just pick one. So the one that they write, up, write about at some length would be the use of the US Special 301 um, annual reports. Um, those annual reports are evaluations, if you like, uh, from the perspective of the USTR, the US Trade Representative, of how different countries across the globe actually um, protect um, intellectual property rights. And so you've got a priority watch list and a normal watch list, and non-performing or poorly performing states are placed on whichever one of those lists um, would be um, considered appropriate by the authors of the report. Um, how this is characterized by Cornish and Lidl is that using this report actually puts considerable policy and trade pressure on countries that are put on the watch list for priority or the normal one. Um, and um, I didn't highlight this um, at the top. So this is a, a procedure um, that predates the TRIPS agreement and which continued after the coming in force of the TRIPS agreement. And uh, Professor Cornish and Lidl note that um, the US modified how it was using the reports prior to the coming into force of uh, TRIPS, um, but they say that um, the way in which this is done is a diplomatic um, sleight of hand. Um, so they will still list countries on there, uh, but they would not uh, carry out or, um, any trade sanctions, but still the very listing of countries uh, is still problematic, and some countries would do their utmost to stay off those lists. Uh, not others, not all. Some take pride in actually being on the list, but that's uh, not what I want to talk about um, today. So, remember the argument is we don't need to change the laws because we've got the TRIPS agreement, why don't you use them? I then wanted to talk about this example, and I'm glad Enrico's here because uh, in a book that he co-edited uh, a few years ago um, that was highlighting some of the absurdities that we see in the experience of intellectual property, um, I got an opportunity to, to write a chapter. In this chapter, I wrote about three case studies, but I only want to speak about one. Um, and this one would be the infamous South African litigation, which I think everybody knows about. Um, in that case, um, South Africa was amending its laws in order to domesticate um, some of these flexibilities. And Graham says that this was quite modest use, which is correct. Um, I mean, all South Africa wanted to do was to permit parallel imports, um, make sure that generic substitution was possible, and to introduce some price control um, into its laws. These amendments were going to be in the Medicines and Related Substances Control Act, um, and they had been passed in 1997. Um, there was almost immediately um, opposition um, to that, um, an application was filed against the South African government, naming the president, the minister of health, and, and others um, as respondents, arguing that these um, amendments were unlawful, that they were counter to the TRIPS agreement, that they, for instance, discriminated against uh, patents in the pharmaceutical field, um, that the enablement of power imports, so to allow uh, people to go to other countries and purchase the medication where it was available on the market and bring into South Africa, that would be tantamount to um, expropriation without compensation of intellectual property rights. Um, it was argued that the powers given to the Minister of Health to draft the regulations to do all of these things were unlimited and so uh, we were not permissible. And so that crudely put or in broad strokes way was the argument against the, the amendments. There was a lot of fight back on the other side, pushback, if you will. Um, the application, we had parties joining the application as friends of the court. For example, the treatment action campaign led by Zahi Ahmad, um, who you see there in the picture with Nelson Mandela joined. Um, they started a really robust national and international um, program of protesting um, the, the application and opposing it. Um, on the other side, there also was pushback from the applicants 
um, the 41 pharmaceutical companies and their association. Um, they successfully lobbied or successfully um, applied for South Africa to be placed on the US uh, 301 uh, report on the priority watch list, and that was done in 98 and 99, um, and the matter was really hotly contested. It was a matter that was uh, almost determined on the global stage, if you like. The court of public opinion was also sitting um, just as much as a real court would sit when the matter was finally settled down. Um, there was a lot of movement towards the Doha Declaration, which was a declaration of um, the WTO on public health, um, which uh, emphasized and clarified that states could use um, the uh, flexibilities in a number of really important ways. That was definitely going to be adopted in November 2001. Um, and so that, if you like, chilled the application. Um, and the US government, somewhere in the middle, so it started in 97, around 2000, and 2000 in May, um, when the opposition was very loud, uh, very strong, very robust, an executive order was then passed, um, and that executive order said that the US was not going to uh, punish or miss countries um, on their reports simply because they were using flexibilities to ensure access to life-saving medication. Um, and so thereafter, after 2000, uh, South Africa did not appear on the special 301 report in relation to, to this matter. And finally, the matter was settled in April uh, 2001. So there was quite a lot of activity over the four years. I spent some time talking about this case uh, in very broad strokes, just to show that it's not a simple matter to say to states, you have the flexibilities, you use them. Um, when states do try to use the flexibilities in often very modest ways, um, there's a lot of opposition and it's, it's really hard. Um, South Africa managed to succeed in this instance, but perhaps it was because of, partly because of the Mandela brand, partly because of the very robust and visible public um, demonstration campaigns that were held. So with that experience then, we reach the present moment. Um, we know the arguments of TRIPS flexibilities held sway during the TRIPS waiver proposal negotiations and actually influenced the outcome leading to the narrow um, waiver that was issued. But again, those uh, discussions are back very much on the table with regard to the WHO pandemic accord. And I'm going to come back a bit later and talk about the peace clause, which really was a clause that was being proposed to make it absolutely clear that states could indeed use the flexibilities without um, any repercussions, but I will return to that. Before I can do that, I thought it would be a good idea um, to talk about the WHO pandemic accord negotiations. These are ongoing. I think many of us are following them. Um, I didn't follow them today, uh, but yesterday, um, many of the matters were still very open. Um, they were coded yellow, which meant there was no consensus. There were very few groups. And so this is chapter two of uh, the WHO pandemic accord text. And right in the middle of it, you've got article 11, which is the article that I want to talk about. And this is the article that speaks about transfer of technology and know-how for the production of pandemic-related health products. But I just wanted to place it almost in context so you see where it sits. Um, in my view, I think it is the heart of chapter two um, of the pandemic accord. And uh, one of the things that Professor Cornish and Professor Little said in their 2016 um, chapter on the TRIPS agreement was that if you're really serious about technology transfer, um, what needs to happen is that the core of the technology, uh, that information is disclosed or passed through patent uh, specifications, but they also pointed out that a lot of really relevant information is kept. It's not in the patent specification. It's maintained as a trade secret. And so if you really want technology transfer to happen, um, you also need to couple what is available publicly in the patent specification with the handover, at least, or sharing of the trade secrets that would make it possible to work the invention. And that's really key, I think, when we think about the provisions that we find in Article um, 11. So this is what Article 11 looks like. Put a lot of text on the slide, you obviously can't read it, uh, but I will talk to you about what the text is about. I've highlighted certain things. Um, so this is the article that tries to make sure that there is effective and meaningful tech transfer. The version that I've got on the screen is um, 
versions A, I, and B9 slash 3, uh, revision 1. That is the version that they went into the talks with uh, when the talks started um, last week on the 29th of April. But of course, we know that the text will be different when this current round of negotiation ends. So it's a moving text, if you like, in that sense. Uh, but I wanted to highlight certain things, and these are the highlighted bits. Um, and this, the first is that um, each party, so states, um, are being uh, required to make sure that they support um, sufficient, sustainable, and geographically diversified production of pandemic-related health products. Um, and then there are certain things that they need to do. So they need to promote or enable technology transfer, particularly for the benefit of developing countries. That's kind of the first phrase that I've highlighted. Um, and also to make sure that those technologies that have benefited from public funding in their development would also be, be available. So good opening, so far so good. Um, but for me, the wheels came to a screeching halt in the very next line. Um, and it says that states would promote this through a variety of measures such as licensing on mutually agreed terms. And there's a lot of contestation <coughs> about that. So it talks about a variety um, and then mentions voluntary licensing. It does not speak about compulsory licensing, which is one of the public interest mechanisms that are available. So that's the first thing. Um, then it goes, the clause, pro the provision proceeds. It talks about the fact that states need to encourage research and development institutes and, and uh, manufacturers again, particularly those receiving public, uh, public funding, to forego or reduce for limited duration royalties on the use of their technology. So it, it is conceiving of a voluntary scheme where um, the right holders would share um, and they, they are being prom um, encouraged to forego royalties um, if, if that is possible. Um, it goes on the next highlighted bit where there's a lot of color here, the pink and the yellow, Again, reference to voluntary arrangements. Um, it's not talking about private right holders and saying that um, they are being encouraged, it's promoted that they would um, transfer technology on fair and most favorable terms. Uh, for example, they could be consensual or preferential terms, again, in accordance with mutually agreed um, terms and conditions. And so the point really is that this whole thing seems to hinge on voluntary um, arrangements um, entering into negotiations with the various right holders, which we know is more easily said um, than done. Um, the next bit of use um, underlining there again speaks about um, the holders of patents who again have received public funding um, to forego royalties. It's more of the same. And then finally, we get to paragraph F, which talks about other information. So if we start from the position that it's patents, but it's also trade secrets. It's important that uh, there's a provision there that deals with that, and the question then is, is it sufficient? Um, again, states are only asked to encourage manufacturers to share as appropriate during pandemics information that is relevant. Um, interesting, we could stop there, but and talk uh, who decides what is appropriate. Again, it's voluntary, and the right holders decide uh, what they should be sharing. And so in my view, um, this whole scheme of things uh, does not go enough. Um, there should be some compulsion, and we should actually be seeing some provisions that make technology transfer of patent information and trade secrets actually mandatory, non-voluntary, or compulsory, whichever word is least offensive um, would work for me. Um, and so the rest of Article 11 Lots of text again, uh, but what I wanted to talk about would be, remember building up to the peace clause, um, and so paragraph four speaks about the flexibilities, um, and the state parties who are members of the WTO are reaffirming that um, they have the right to use to the full the, trips, the flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement, uh, including those uh, that have been reaffirmed in the Doha Declaration of 2000. So it just reaffirms that they can be used. Um, but we know that the experience of actually trying to use the trips flexibilities um, is not as easy as one would imagine. The last bit that I want to pick up and put on the table and, and then move on from this would be another contentious provision in this article. And this is this one, that the state parties working through the conference of parties 
with established regional or global technology and know-how transfer hubs. Um, that wording, the underlined bit, the establish, um, is, is, is contested. There are some countries who say they should not be established in this agreement. It should simply be, it should be considered and there will be another instrument later on to actually establish these hubs. Um, but this is really critical infrastructure. We need to have the hubs um, so that the technology transfer um, can work with some oversight um, or help from the WHO. So what then is the peace clause? So under Article 4, there was a suggestion to introduce a subparagraph, which is the part in blue. So I put this whole thing on the, the slides just to illustrate a point, and that is that the negotiations of the agreement have been very contested. Um, in the square brackets, you will often have countries, those are the letters or the, the abbreviations representing certain countries, showing that they have a problem or they have a point to make about a word in the text. So that's, well, those are all the comments uh, or input that was received in relation just to paragraph four, those first four lines. So that's one would have thought that wouldn't have been something that would be contested, things that uh, were something that states would quibble about, but they, they did quibble about it. Um, but the peace clause then is the highlighted in blue. And the suggestion was that under that clause that says countries can use to the full the TRIPS flexibilities, that they be a paragraph that reads, the parties shall not challenge or otherwise exercise any direct or indirect pressure on the parties that, um, that undermine the right of W2 members to use TRIPS flexibilities at any multilateral, regional, bilateral, judicial, or diplomatic forum. And this was just an acknowledgement and appreciation of the fact that pressure is often um, exerted on countries that want to use TRIPS flexibilities in a number of places. And the idea was simply to have this day, uh, this commitment um, to not exert this unnecessary pressure. Um, this provision did not make it. Um, it, it was culled, um, it was rejected, and, and that actually gives me pause for thought. Um, so no country, to my knowledge, has ever acknowledged that it exerts any pressure, due or undue. All countries say we don't do this. We, we know everyone's got the right to, to use the trips flexibilities. And so if that indeed is the position, if no one has, no one is, and no one will exert any undue pressure, surely there is no problem in actually having a clause that says that. Um, so it's quite telling that uh, still the clause is um, rejected. Um, and just the, the exclusion of that clause from the pandemic accord, um, if you think about the text that has been used in the provisions that I showed you earlier on, uh, which speak about a number of mechanisms and then specifically mention the voluntary. Now, if you think about those two together, um, it, it gives this appearance that there is an international norm, if you like, an international reluctance to use the compulsory mechanisms um, because it just won't be put in the agreement. Um, yet the, the underlying text or underlying arguments is, oh, but of course it, it is part of the ASEAN that states have and they should use it. Again, um, my challenge would be, if it is, then why don't we actually have the language of compulsory licensing if there's no problem with it? Um, but we, we don't have it um, in, in the agreement uh, draft as we have it. And um, its inclusion really would have gone a long way in reassuring states um, that they could use compulsory means um, and so I then wanted to cross the pond again um, and, and think about, okay, so the argument is, oh, this is part of the arsenal. This is part of the, the tools that states have in their toolboxes. They can use flexibilities. They can use compulsory licenses. And so they should go ahead and do that. Um, the, the EU actually is well on its way um, to doing that. Um, and um, it's early days still, um, but there has been a first sitting um, for um, this um, text, which they adopted, I believe just a few weeks ago, um, which talks about compulsory licensing for crisis management, and this is going to be uh, amending an existing regulation. Um, so the EU is going full steam ahead, actually, in their own space um, to, to use the, the compulsory um, approach. And so I've just copied and pasted some of the text and made some comments 
Um, so, for example, what is being envisaged uh, in the EU uh, would be a temporary and non-exclusive union compulsory license. So it's not being kept, it's not being left to individual states to actually have compulsory licenses in their domestic laws. The idea is to have a union compulsory license so that the medical technologies can actually move across borders, which is what needs to happen in a health emergency. So thinking about the cross-border, there are some caveats, if you like, there is necessary limitation to what this um, union compulsory license might be. So the wording of the uh, text is that it will be a last resort. Um, it will only be resorted to if the voluntary mechanism doesn't work. And, um, you know, you need to have a time limit on the voluntary mechanisms uh, because, you know, you could be in negotiations for a very long time. And so the, the regulation, the draft text says that after four weeks, if the voluntary arrangements have not been brokered, sealed, concluded, then we move to the compulsory. I think that's really good to put a time limit on it. Um, and then in addition to that, um, this text actually goes to the trade secrets and it says that uh, where appropriate, the commission, which would be the one that grants the union compulsory license, should also be <coughs> to force the right holder to disclose the trade secrets which are necessary in order to work um, the inventions or to achieve the purpose of the compulsory license. Um, adequate remuneration would be determined uh, by the commission. And so there is a scheme at EU level about a compulsory union license. Um, and so um, if within regions it's possible to do this, I would argue that then there should be no problem in actually incorporating a similar mechanism uh, in the global agreement. So earlier on on my slides, I've spoken about the regional, um, the regional development. So the EU is one. Um, I wanted to go back to my own continent, to Africa, to talk about what Africa has done internally uh, within the regional trading bloc, um, you know, whilst we're still working on the global. So in the African continental free trade area, there is a protocol on intellectual property rights. Um, and in that protocol, there are provisions on patents and trade secrets um, that make it possible um, to ensure um, mandatory tech transfer. So Article 12 on patents, um, you know, we did. I've highlighted what I consider to be the important parts, but um, it, you know, it makes those really important policy uh, points about patents should not hinder access to medicines, vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, and other healthcare essential tools. Um, it reaffirms in paragraph two that states have the right to use the flexibilities. Um, and so that, that's a good start, if you like, um, but there is no detail. It hasn't gone as far as the EU approach which actually puts in mechanism. This actually just restates um, the policy approach. Um, it requires states to make sure that there are domestic provisions in place to enable compulsory licensing, um, either by um, ratifying the TRIPS amendment or if they have not ratified it or if they are not a member of the WTO, to still make sure um, that in their domestic space there is provision for the granting of compulsory licenses, which would allow export um, to countries with limited or no domestic pharmaceutical manufacturing um, capacity. Um, it also speaks about an exception for uh, information for marketing approvals because we know that one of the things that stop uh, medical technologies or biological <coughs> products from reaching uh, people it needs to reach is because they're held up in the regulatory approvals uh, because the generic manufacturers, for example, would not have access uh, to clinical data protection, uh, clinical data because it's protected as a trade secret. So the idea is that there could be an exception to allow that to happen. Um, so good opening gambit. Um, Article 15 is the one that talks about uh, the protection of undisclosed uh, information and talks about the, the trade secrets that are necessary um, to work the invention and also for the regulatory approval. Again, there is no equivalent of a union compulsory license. Um, and the mechanism is not there. The policy framing is there, which is really important, but the mechanism still is lacking. And so this is why we actually, um, I believe, need um, a really strong mechanisms uh, to do this. And so Luke and Olga uh, have published very recently um, a South Views um, at the end of April where they propose uh, one such mechanism, which I think would really go a long way um, in making sure that technology transfer happens 
And so because Lucas here, I, I don't have to give the full detail of how it works, so I'll speak in broad terms, and if there are questions, perhaps you can uh, fill them in or give a full account um, in the discussion section. But I wanted to highlight just a few aspects. So first of all, what their proposal does is set up the infrastructure. It sets up the infrastructure in three parts, if you like, um, and the infrastructure is within the domain of the WHO, one, two, three, WHO. And so what the WHO would do in terms of this proposal would be to maintain a list of pandemic-related products and technologies. So this is what we're gonna need. They've got the list in the same way they have a list of essential medicines, for example. Um, they would also have a list um, of right holders and the states in which um, they hold those necessary rights. That's the second part of the infrastructure, list of right holders and those states. Those states in the proposal are referred to as facilitating states. Those would be the states that would make the technology transfer happen, the mandatory um, tech transfer happen. And then the third part of the infrastructure is the establishment of technology transfer hubs or a similar structure um, that might be used by the WHO and countries in order to make the tech transfer happen. So that's the, the infrastructure um, that's set up in that proposal. Um, once, the, uh, once a pandemic is declared, um, then a state, let's say there's a suitable manufacturer, they, there's, a, there's manufacturing capacity in any state, a Zani or whatever, make up a state, um, they would um, indicate to their home state, that is the requesting state, that we, we have some capacity we would like to start uh, producing, but we don't have li a license or we don't have access, could you please then help us get it? So that state would then make a request, that's the requesting state, um, it would make a request uh, to the facility, facilitating state, which is the state where the right holder uh, and the rights reside, and that facilitating state then would have the duty or the obligation to actually make sure that mandatory tech transfer happens, and that's how the system would work. Um, so the facilitating, sta facilitating state would need to make sure that all relevant information, including patents, published and unpublished patent applications, trade secrets, the whole, whatever is necessary, that facilitating state must make sure that its laws and its processes make it possible for them to force or to mandate or to compel tech transfer. On the other side, the requesting state would have a number of duties such as confirming that the manufacturer is indeed suitable, they have the capacity to manufacture if given access to the intellectual property that they require, um, and they would also have to make the necessary arrangements in their own jurisdiction to make it possible um, for the mandatory tech transfer to happen. Because this tech transfer would include undisclosed or separate information or trade secrets, the requesting state would also have the obligation of making sure that the suitable manufacturer actually protects um, that undisclosed information. So this is, this is a really great uh, proposal um, that would um, help, I think, um, the mechanism that would make it work within the um, WHO accord. Um, so if accepted, if, you know, it, it would be 11 plus uh, an additional um, paragraph. Um, so this proposal also borrows or builds from a medicines going policy proposal, um, which is incorporated actually into this proposal. So I'm sure you'll have access to the printout um, or the electronic version of the presentation, and so you could follow those links to read a bit more um, about those two proposals if you are so inclined. So after this long trip around the globe and looking at different regulatory moments, so for me the regulatory moments would have been the HIV AIDS moment, late 1999 to early 2000s, what we saw there, um, and maybe the outcome at that stage would have been the Doha Declaration in 2001. Um, the second regulatory moment that we had was in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic when the TRIPS waiver proposal was being uh, proposed, supported at uh, TRIPS. Um, there was some traction there, but the, the um, ultimate outcome was not um, achieved. And now the third regulatory moment that confronts the world, I believe, is the pandemic accord at the WHO. So three very clear normative uh, moments that have confronted us um, as humanity. And the question then for me is that metaphor. Um, is intellectual property still omnipresent, omnipresent, relevant, distracting? And to add my twist to it, 
Are we still nervous about the benefits that we get? Um, sadly, I think I gave the game a long, long the game away a long time ago. Sadly, I think we haven't moved. So we've been confronted by these three very distinct moments, yet the same arguments are still being proffered. We are still squabbling over the same things. Should we compel? Should we not? Should we have a mechanism? Should we not? Um, and so I think that we haven't moved from that moment and that Professor Cornish's uh, metaphor is still very apt. Um, if we are, in a sense, stagnated, um, is there any way of taking us out of this time warp, the, this repeated um, arguments that we keep uh, making. I would argue, and, and many others uh, who've been writing in the last 10 or so years, would argue maybe that the way to actually move these normative debates and scholarly debates forward would be to think more broadly about intellectual property, um, to think more beyond them just being private rights that can be uh, maximized uh, or used to the benefit of the right holder but to put them within a context. A context, for example, of severe massive health emergencies that we've had in the past that we are likely to continue facing um, in the future as we huddle towards this poly crisis. Um, and as I said earlier, some would argue that we are indeed already in the poly crisis. So the way through, I think, um, agreeing with many others, is that if we start framing intellectual property within sustainable development goals and other developmental agendas. So we can pick up any regional developmental agenda, maybe talk about Africa, the Africa 2063 agenda. All of those are very common. They share the same goals. Um, and maybe if we put intellectual property and its use uh, in that context, uh, we might see our way through to prioritizing health, saving lives, uh, in addition, if we add to the SDGs, maybe if we focus also um, on the human rights aspects and think about the rights to life, rights to health, um, that also might give us a little bit more traction. And then we may finally, finally be able to put the metaphor of an unpleasant skin condition behind us and start talking about meaningful intellectual property rights. And uh, that's really where I want to stop. Um, my Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'll now call upon uh, Professor Uma Sutherson from Queen Mary to uh, give her a response. So you can come take a seat if you like. Would, yeah, Caroline, you can take a seat as well uh, beside uh, Uma if you like. Luke for inviting me um, to this event. I, I, I'm not quite sure what a discussant does, uh, and I thought it was a it was a very nice title that allowed me to say whatever I wanted to say. Okay, I got that right. And um, because it's in relation to the Bill Cornish um, lecture, perhaps, perhaps I should um, start with my own recollection of Bill, which is very short. Uh, Bill did not teach me. Uh, I never co-wrote anything, of course, with him. And I think I met him three times. The most important was the first time because I had studied his book as an undergraduate at the National University of Singapore. It, it was the, 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 the standard text all over the world by the second edition. And the first time I met him was, I think it was a Tory lecture or something. And I was a first year PhD student, uh, rather nervous, and thought, oh my God, it's the man. I gushed, I, I, I almost leapt at him, it's all, as, as you know, PhD students do, you know, through utter nervousness and um, hero worship, and said, oh, Professor Cordish, I read your book for my undergraduate days. 
He was so kind. He gave such a sympathetic smile. And he laid his hand on my shoulder and said, you poor girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, well, um, and the second thing I remember was he was my referee for going from senior lectureship to readership. And I, I thanked him through a postcard. And he was cute. He sent me back the same postcard I had sent him to thank him. I mean, like, why bother with the new postcard? You know, let's save the trees. And scribbled on it, keep on writing. So I hope I'm doing that. I mean, it may not be lucid, but I am trying to keep on writing. Thank you, Caroline, for this. And I'm so glad for me that I met you. And first of all, I might as well just put everyone to ease and say I, I, I completely agree with everything she says. So I just want to pull some of the things she said into a more macro perspective view of intellectual property through about, I think, 12 points. It's actually 12 minutes. First of all, all IP aficionados in this room know and accept that the IP system is the dominant global legal system, which regulates the ownership, consumption, and dissemination of human knowledge as expressed and experienced in its many manifestations in science and culture. Some of those words, by the way, were covered in the second edition of the Cornish textbook. And we know and accept that IP is a universally accepted framework for converting human creati uh, creativity into private property. And that was the first thing I'm so glad you highlighted towards the end, that notion of private ownership and whether or not uh, intellectual property has fallen out of these narrow boundaries. And we accept that intellectual property may foster economic growth in high income nations. However, we also reluctantly have to acknowledge it destabilizes the socioeconomic welfare of vulnerable communities. It ignores the diverse needs of knowledge producers as well as consumers and of vulnerable, society, uh, vulnerable communities, such as not just indigenous communities, but also women, for example, as the recent House of Commons report on misogyny in the music industry shows that the, of the use of contracts with an IP um, severely undermines and enhances the gender imbalances in pay in the UK. Uh, so there is something not quite right about the IP system. I think everyone who loves IP agrees with this. I believe part of the problem is the dominant economic approach <coughs> that we accept. Um, which justifies the extension, the valorization, and eventual private ownership of entire knowledge landscapes. This talk has been on medicines and, and vaccines, but we can extend the analogy, I think, quite easily. And the Edward Elka companion book, by the way, which I think is wonderful, I read through it uh, on SDGs, you can extend all the analogies and arguments made by Caroline here to other areas um, which affect farmers, which affect agriculture, and other areas vital to hum humanity. So there is something not quite right. And, and Bill Cornish's book, uh, Omniscience and, and Omnipresence, sorry, irrelevant um, book, does manage from time to time um, and in the way, if, if all of y'all have read Cornish, you know, one of the most wonderful things he, he managed to do, which I still aspire, is he managed to compress about 20 ideas in a very concise, elegant writing. Um, and you have to unpack them, and you keep on unpacking them years to come. And he managed to, to, to do that, uh, allude to some of the issues I'm going to bring up here, and to the fact that there is a nuanced nexus between the fact that IP may be good, but it's also bad. Um, and we know, I think we know, all the IP aficionados in this room and elsewhere on the whole planet, we know that our current global legal norms originated in European 18th century norms. We know that. We may forget it from time to time, but we do know that. Our current norms have been extended under international laws. Um, it has displaced a lot of local histories, a lot of local customs, diverse economies and social cultures. It has pockets here and there. And 
the fact that our current norms, our current IP system, is a palimpsest, constantly being overridden again and again and again as something new comes and says some sort of it. Book on it referred to, to that uh, idea of the expanding IP universe. He says it's either by emulation or creation. Either we, 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 we expand pattern and expand copyright to take in new things over and over again, new subject matter, new rights, etc. Or we basically emulate it and produce the whole canon of Sui Generis rights. Uh, for example, petty pattern systems or designs, um, passing up, for example. So that's why perhaps we have this first issue, this problem about why we're not changing. The word polycrisis was used by, by Karen, which I, I do like, but also the fact that um, nothing changes. And nothing may be changing because we're still relying on early rationales. I mean, some of these early rationales, don't forget, came from medieval practices, like the printing privileges, etc. Um, and some of these early rationales originated within different timelines, different economies, different societies, but it's all been pushed together, that's a word I just invented, uh, into the, the, the world IP system. Surprisingly, some other more communitarian and humanitarian rationales may have been forgotten or they haven't been included in um and 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 i'm, I'm not going to go into that but there are there were sorry other rationales talking about the commonwealth of the country or the welfare of the state rather than the individual inventor and it is important as well that we look more seriously at intellectual property partly because it does govern as i said human knowledge and human knowledge emanates from every individual community and nation state. It, it, it's not just the big firms in five countries. Um, every single human collection gives out human knowledge. It is the totality of humanity in a way, of a time and space. And in that way, if we still keep on thinking about it as a private property system, um, you're never going to solve this. Um, with that mindset. However, I say to you, this is about solving the fact that we're talking about the ownership of humanity's knowledge and for generations to come, it may perhaps shift maybe some governments. Usually the Scandinavian governments are the first ones to be you know, more communitarian. Another thing that I think IPFSC you know, are aware of but perhaps also try to ignore especially in the world of practice, is the fact that IP affects trade, you know, lives, medical, genetic, environmental, food-related resources, if we're all here, in case I forgot. It's because it's a rule-based world order. It generates complexity within the international IP order. And just to name a few organizations who are involved, I mean, we, we know about WIPO, the dominant arbiter of IP rules. We know about WTO. There's also COP, of course, under the Nagoya Protocol on the, C on the Convention on Biological Diversity. There is the United Nations Human Rights Council. Together at times with the International Labour Organization, it has come in from time to time to empower the creative labour, as we saw in the Rome Convention for the Performer. There is UNESCO and the FAO, which comes in, of course, to offer, helpfully, alternative non-property public policy heritage of mankind values, you know, in order to basically confuse us at times, uh, in relation to plant and genetic resources. The WHO has waded in because it prioritizes health values over private property rights. And recently, thanks to my reading of a lot of Siva Tambisati's work, she's um, the UN Convention on the Law of Sea, UNCLOS, under the BBNJ Treaty 2023, um, apparently has introduced a new global norm on benefit sharing from the use of marine genetic resources and digital sequences thereof. This is used patent ownership. So, the, the, there are a lot of organizations um, pushing in different, slightly different rules. Uh, with different types of beneficiaries, with different starting points. Not necessarily the dominant economic approach, but some of them do start from a rights-based approach as well, and, 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 and others um, start from 
and approach in relation to the resource they're looking at without really taking any sides. The other thing is that Caroline Lecture, you know, you highlighted this interaction, I thought, so wonderfully, so that's why I agree completely, about the world organizations and the international rules. Um, and also national rules like the United States Section 301 section, and regional rules like the EU, you know, um, EU's policy on, in this area, the political struggle to interpret TRIPS flexibility, and something else, the underlying power of corporations. I think we all know it. I don't know how much we know about how much power they have, if that makes sense. I know we talk about it, and there's always an argument about academics always stressing that, that these knowledge behemoths, as someone called them, are completely monopolistic and completely dominant. Of course, the same people we know, an IP right does not mean you are monopolistic in the marketplace. It all means, you know, it all depends on substitutability and all those lovely tests that we have in competition law. However, Corporations also fight, uh, fight, especially the ones who are very invested in the particular industry, not just pharmaceuticals, but also the publishing industry, for example, and you know, other types of industry. They fight on two fronts, the international front, I believe. And we know about the music industry, what, what's called the revolving door policy, where a person sits on in WIPO, and then the next moment you find that they have gone to Sony to become a vice president. And then voila, four years later, they are in the US Copyright Office. How interesting. Um, but, but, but it is the same person, rather like the Lord Chancellor, you know, switching hats. And at this point, you start to wonder, why does this private property uh, species deserve so much attention from public corporations and governments as well. Um, there, there must be something more. And there is. We know there is. So the other thing I'd like to point out to Anne again, the lecture was about technology transfer towards the end and um, voluntary licensing systems in mutually agreed terms. One of the things about the power, of course, of corporate IP ownership is the fact that the IP owner knows how to negotiate a very Byzantine labyrinth of interconnected rules underpinned by contract. Um, and of course, if it's just one small SME or one inventor, we wouldn't be that bothered. But no, it, it, they are large corporations with the power to effect millions of contracts uh, around the world in, in relation to some goods, or very few contracts in relation to medicines, but powerful contracts. And in this way, I do believe that, that, that part of the problem with IP is the reluctance to, to deal with the issue of ownership um, with, with large corporations, because of the, their knowledge of, of the rules enables them to control global distribution of knowledge you know, in any manner whatsoever. They control the journey of the resource. We all know that, that's what the rights are. It, it controls the resource throughout the world. But think of it, if I say it this way, by controlling the whole life cycle of the resource, they are also controlling humanity's life cycle because it is access to the resource. It is use of the resource. If the resource is medicines, so if the resource is food, which affects food security, then they are affecting humanity. I mean, one individual is still part of humanity. I'll come back to that big humanity thing in just a second. Um, and the deployment of contract, I think, adds to the worry. Um, and therefore, the, 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 the lecture in terms of highlighting to us that we need to look at technology transfer and different models of license and, you know, um, it's really, more, really quite important. The other thing that struck me was the EU approach, which I hadn't really thought about, if I'm honest, until I heard you today. Why is the EU approach to cross-border crisis so different? Um, we're almost embracing public interest with open arms. And I did wonder, well, if one harks back again to the start of intellectual property from you know, a myriad 
rationales and norms from the medieval times, there were a lot of communitarian values for the early privilege system. Um, and there is perhaps pockets of resistance within the European Union um, to, to have such diverse rationales, perhaps. I don't know. Perhaps it is a more pluralistic, more holistic sort of legal environment compared to the United States. Um, perhaps the EU is more communitarian. I'm just saying, I'm not a, you know, asserting here. So the next thing that I did enjoy was the fact that she has asked us to look at, and she and her co-editors, but, but to, 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 to strengthen my point about SDGs. I think SDGs are invaluable because it's one of the few global set of rules, one of the few global orders that incorporates both rights-based and economic arguments. It's very difficult sometimes to argue on rights-based terms. Even my students look unbelievingly at me when I talk about human rights and the rights of man and the dignity of man. Half of them wanting to become corporate lawyers, wondering why is she wasting two hours on this? You know, please tell us more on licensing uh, or on economic arguments. It, it, it is very clear to me. However, the SDGs, I think, try very hard, and I think they're quite good in talking about innovation and knowledge production, not just also transfer, and, and, and perhaps it may have a better future. However, so I'm ending, right? Um, what should the future be? Well, two things. One, perhaps, we should go back to the drawing board, and I, I, I think Caroline hints at this, and Bill Cornish hints at this. Go back to the drawing board to, for two very basic questions. Very basic. What does IP law extend to? To whom does it extend to? And why do we have IP law? They're almost like basic PhD starter questions. I know. But it's like going back to Fritz Macklop's 1952 study that he did to the US, you know, subcommittee, which is the same question they asked him, you know, and it was good. Um, it's been cited by people who are pro IP and anti IP. That's how good that report is, and that knows. Um, the last thing I would say is, if I can find it, um, Professor Cornish, I think, uh, was very prescient. So, I mean, it's not just omnipresent, relevant, and distract, uh, distracting, written by perhaps prescient Bill Cornish. Because there is one paragraph where he manages to say everything I, I waffled on for 15 minutes, and I want to read it to you and I'll learn. Today, patenting is blame. I'm sorry, when was this book written? 2004. Gosh, okay, he said it in 2004. Today, patenting is blamed for imposing impossible prices on developing countries, desperate for anti-AIDS drugs and other medical supplies, which would give practical expression to the right to life and health. So even he realized there has to be a nexus between a rights-based discourse and patents. Then he goes on, equally it's claimed that multinationals go on biopiracy raids in traditional communities. They search for folk medicines. I think he means traditional medicines. <laughs> then they patent techno variants without a care for the expropriation. Patents are denounced as the ultimate conjuring trick for keeping computer software locked under the key of the world's richest man. Meanwhile, banks and finance houses lead the way towards patents of a business, met, uh, business methods. They would supplant healthy competition in novel products with cunning new financial services that are sealed against emulation. And patents symbolize the selfish and gross commercialization of basic scientific research, in some instances offending deep ethical and in 2004, he said it, environmental beliefs. Many who would never speak in Marxian terms nonetheless regard what is happening as a commodification too far. I used to read this to my son. <laughs> um, and, and, and just think of the words he said that, you know, Marxists uh, gone too far, environment, folk medicine, um, and competition.
And I think you said it too, but in your own way. <laughs> Thank you. the floor for questions, also um, online in case they want to we'll, ask questions. We'll, we also online. can have questions online. So Martin is going around with a microphone. Uh, if you raise your hand, uh, one of us will, will be able to find you. Enrico, you look like you have a question. I do, actually, yes. Because I never understood you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Caroline, for your great presentation. I mean, just with reference to the South African case, right? I never understood 1999, then it was abandoned in 2001 because they understood it was a terrible PR thing. But I never understood why they could claim that a country introducing parallel imports international exhaustion is against trips. Did they read Article 6 of the trips agreement? I, I, never, I never understood that. Did you? <laughs> I mean, yeah. how is it possible? I mean, maybe we were a late nineties they didn't study the trips agreement. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other two measures, no, the, the fact that uh, uh, pharmacists were authorized to recommend the generic version instead of the branded medicine. I mean, as far as I know, this is quite widespread in many countries, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the UK brought it in when I was still at the bar. <laughs> and yet they challenged this domestically. So I, I wonder if you have some insights on, you know, they were badly advised by their lawyers. I don't know. I, I really don't understand. That's my simple question. Yeah, so you were maybe both asking the same question. I just never uh, really understood it because, uh, you know, the the law and TRIPS was on the side of, of the South African government. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the provisions. Article 6 of TRIPS says a state can choose whatever uh, principle of um, exhaustion that they wish. And so I wonder what that was. Maybe that was a play. So I, I like how that volume that you edited was all about absurdities. And, and that's, that's the right word to describe what was going on here. It was absurd. Um, and I wonder if it was just a gamble to see maybe if we file maybe the government will fold maybe i, I don't know I, I have no idea i have no insight um but we know that um the the proposals are very common but we know that the arguments had been tried elsewhere so the eu had sued canada at the wto dispute settlement body and tried to make some of the same arguments they failed then so surely in South Africa, it should have been clear that those arguments would, would not pass. But I, I don't know what was happening. Uh, crazy moment in time. But maybe Graham knows what was going on. Graham has a question. Well, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the misfortunes is when Second. Is, uh, which I blame Bill Gates for. Is, thank you. Uh, oh, many things. But one thing is that you can't change, switch your Outlook, old Outlook emails onto when you change job you sort of lose them all i think it's absolute tragedy because archive i'm trying to one day I'm, if i've got time and money willingness to pay an assistant to art to archive from an earlier computer from her previous job or these emails because i was sort of around a little bit so uh, one thing uh, one thing um that i heard uh and i met i was there was this meeting at Chatham House about 2001 or something, and there was this rather unusual lady uh, called Muriel Adib, and I think she was the head of the South African version of IFPMA, but it was the association, right? Um, so um, it was in part at least her initiative. But the other things were going on because there's also Al Gore got um, involved as well, which was, which uh, didn't, I don't think this is political cause any good at all, uh, but that's another matter. Um, but I mean, the industry at some point did actually dis disassociate themselves from the whole thing. But I did talk to, uh, to Fred Abbott, Professor Abbott at the, uh, at the time, who was advising the South African, African government, he said, look, they had absolutely no legal case at all. It was just nothing at all. Um, so, I mean, I think the mystery continues with that little bit that I know. 
I don't think it really helps, but it does. Uh, uh, sometimes individual personalities, uh, sometimes, sometimes it is actually about a person, you know. And I think uh, um, you know, Ms. D was, was very much at the centre of this. Uh, but obviously it would be nice to know more than that. But, uh, but that's the first step in the sort of detective story. And I hope one day we will get there. But uh, that's one lead, at least. Thank you. The mic is just there. Ah, yes. Is it on? Yes, of course. I speak as someone who was taught by Bill Cornish for three years at this university. He taught me contract, he taught me equity, and the law of industrial relations. <laughs> Neither of us knew anything about IP. <laughs> we, I helped in a small way, build his first course here, the first course at any university in this country, which did any IP. That's what my connection with Bill is. And it was uh, the rest of his life. Very close. Now, I want to read something. So long as men are governed by unexamined prejudices and led away by sounds, it is natural for them to regard patents as unfavorable to the increase of wealth. So as soon as they obtain clear ideas to annex to these sounds, it is impossible for them to do otherwise than recognize them to be favorable to that exercise increase. And that in so essential a degree that the security given to property cannot be said to be complete without it. That is my man much associated with my current university, Jeremy Bentham, 1792. Play with the patent system at your peril. No new medicine has come to market since the Second World War without a big pharma company behind it. No government has ever bought a medicine to market. The great Soviet empire produced no new medicines. I also have quite a lot of experience of compulsory licensing. Because we had compulsory licensing after the First World War. There was a great report saying, oh, the Germans got right ahead of us because of the patent system and they wickedly used it. We should have compulsory lessons, licensing for foods or medicines. And that started being used in the 1960s. Fortunately for the drug companies at the time, the three main users were so dishonest that they never got very far. But then some more honest compulsory licensees came and they became very rich and gave nothing back. Sailing under the brand, oh, we are cheaper, we are saving you every day money. The COVID crisis, what solved it? Insofar as it has been, the vaccines. When were the vaccines invented? The main mRNA ones in the early 2010s. The drug companies are now fighting about the money in the building just along there as it happens at the moment. I was asked to go and address an association of most of the large pharma companies of the world in Switzerland last year. They had an interesting question to they wanted me to deal with. How could they improve their image? Because you hear so much about them as being bad guys, charging a fortune for the, to the sick. I asked them, well, how much did they reckon they made about out of the vaccine? Somebody came up with a figure of $40 million, $40 billion. Peanuts compared with what is at stake in the world. 
how much did it save the world? Do we want vaccine research or do we not? If you're going to say when you need a vaccine, we're going to give compulsory licenses to guys who are going to make money out of it without having done anything, you won't get the research done now. Bentham was right. And the same true for other medicines. Yes, governments put some money in sometimes. It's always a tiny proportion. They never take the risk either. So, you have your choice. If you look back, yes, we give all the medicines away very cheap. If you look forward and you want the medicines for the future, more vaccines, faster production of vaccines, the last thing you want to do is to fracture it. One final little coda, know-how. Those who talk about know-how think it's somewhere in a book. <laughs> it isn't, it's people. It's a team. A vaccine manufacturer, as it stands at the moment at least, is very much like cookery. It's a skill. It's not in a book, there's no great secret of that sort. But people think it is because they want to believe it. Thank you, Robin. Uh, it's always great to have a challenging question. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think we, who, who are maybe on the other side of the debate, need to hear these challenges yeah. to our positions. Um, I mean, I'll say a couple of things and then I'll hand over to Caroline. So there is an interesting model. Um, I, I was lucky enough recently to meet uh, Maria Bottazzi, who along with Peter Hotez at the Texas Children's Center, created a vaccine called Corbivax, and they decided not to file for patents, and they decided not to protect anything through trade secrets, and instead they documented everything. They published about 11 or 12 academic papers, and they offered it to any vaccine manufacturer in the world that would want to have it. And Biological E in India did, and a producer in Botswana did as well. And they transferred the know-how through documentation. They, they were able to do that at that point. A lot of that does happen in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, of course, people are important, but a lot of knowledge can be documented. Um, often voluntary tech transfer agreements do involve that as, as a process. And you know, it might be the case that the Soviet Union failed to produce a medicine, but, you know, Enrico Bonadio, beside you, Robin, has been working with the University of Havana in Cuba, also a communist state, has produced many medicines, and including two, two COVID vaccines that, that they've produced and they shared with the developing world. So there are models out there that perhaps harness some of the best aspects of IP, the aspirational aspects. Um, and I think that we need to acknowledge that um, there's a lot of truth to what Jeremy Benson said and in terms of you know the UK's e economy and um, developed e economies that are now rich have benefited from the IP system, there's no question about that. Um, but I think it's also the case that in the 19th century, you know, Uma mentioned the, the classic article by um, you know, the patent controversy in the 19th century and featured quite heavily in that because at the time patents were seen as trade protectionism. They weren't seen as being part of free trade. They were seen very clearly as protecting the knowledge of certain countries. And the international protection of patents therefore protected those exports. Um, and you know, the, the Dutch decided to abolish their patent system for 30 years to copy, to, to develop, to, to build up their industrial capacity. In part, the Brazilians and the, and the Indians have such a thriving pharmaceutical industry today because they did the same thing in the 70s. They abolished pharmaceutical patents and they copied and they learned from that. Um, so I think that you know, it, it, it's not necessarily an either or, a pro-IP or an anti-IP position, but um, my own view is that um, it is important to listen to the perspective of the Global South and acknowledge that today, with the TRIPS agreement, IP does tend to benefit the IP exporting countries. That some of the promises that were made about tech transfer during the TRIPS agreement negotiations weren't really followed through. Um, so I'll hand, yeah, hand over now to yeah. um, So I think uh, Lucas said um, 
almost everything um, and I agree with all of that. Um, I just wanted to make a point that I omitted to make earlier on. So, so the patents, so one would imagine that these patents that pharma holds that they withheld from, from the hubs, um, that they are invaluable, but they are not. Um, they, they are being contested. So the pharmaceutical companies, as you rightly said themselves, are, are suing each other in relation to this. Uh, Moderna sued, uh, Pfizer, BioNTech in several countries, the US, the UK, Germany, um, and, and they, they are losing some of the, the cases. So late last year, around November... But patents often lose cases. <laughs> yes, of course. But so the point is, it's what they're holding on to is not, in, is, is not iron cast. It's, it's not like the right that they have is beyond challenging. It, it has been challenged, and they have lost some of the challenges. So that's the point that I'm making, that the rights that they're holding on to are, you know, that they have been challenged. Um, and right now, about two weeks ago, it was reported that the U.S. litigation has been paused so that the U.S. PTO actually, again, looks at the validity of two of the Moderna patents. So, I, you know, I really value what you're saying, and I think Luke has answered. I just wanted to, to highlight the fact that some of these patents are questionable themselves. I got my research assistant. Yeah. Not this one. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> my first one. Yeah. Of all the pharma cases I decide as a judge. Yeah. Um, he, he, got, he got 17. Mm. I found for the pharma companies yeah. in eight and against them in seven. Mm -hmm. No, the other way around. For, for them in eight, mm -hmm. uh, against them in seven, but seven. I got reversed in one of those, so right. the result was the other way around. Mm -hmm. That's the system. Yeah. So no good saying it shouldn't be like that, because nobody can think of anything better. But wasn't Luke's idea, wasn't Luke explaining an alternative? There are lots of alternative models to, yeah. to this. Um, I mean, the US government through the NIH is one is the biggest funder of medical knowledge in the world. Um, a lot of inventions come out of that and are then taken on by private companies. But I think we should move on because we have a couple of other questions. I think there's one over here. Okay, sure. Is that on? Okay. Um, so I had a I had actually three questions, but I got a bit waylaid by Robin's uh, comment. Um, and I, I do think pharmaceuticals have a PR problem. Um, I just want to raise something that came up yesterday in the negotiations when they were discussing the peace clause. Um, the EU made a very, um, you know, it left me, and I was very thoughtful for a long time. It's, the EU's position seems to be that we cannot agree with the peace clause because then that would look as if we got in the way of using TRIPS flexibilities. And that was expressed as a reason not to agree with the peace clause. So it's not as if they don't know that, um, you know, inhibiting the use of the flexibilities is ethically problematic. They do know it. So to me, that was a very strong acknowledgement of we don't engage in those dirty games. So you do know that these are unethical practices, or you do know. And I, that was kind of the subtext of, of um, that. I, and it also brings to mind, you know, just going back to what Graham said, um, so much of this is seat of pan stuff. So much of what happens during negotiations and the creation of new norms um, can be completely waylaid by a document appearing in the 11th hour or um, a, a particular term being used that can change things. So this idea that somehow we are, we're working with a system that is robust and coherent and uh, you know, completely immune to contingent stuff, I think, is something that we need to move away from. And I think negotiations are actually a really good context to understand uh, that point. So that was kind of a comment slash question. Um, so maybe two points to make, um, Caroline. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about this notion of developing countries and developed countries. To my mind, I think that um, there's, a, there's a sort of disappearance, there's a sort of convergence um, that's quite difficult to make sense of in these kinds of negotiations. So when the pandemic negotiations started, one of the, um, you know, it got an influential intervention by the Pharma Association was a joint statement with developing country vaccine makers. So these sorts of alliances across developed and developing countries, you know, we're not in the world in which the AIDS crisis rolled out. 
Uh, and that's changed the conversation quite a lot. And I wondered if you would say something about that. And my sort of last question slash point is, I'm quite intrigued about you know, your embrace of sustainable development goals. Uh, they're so open-ended. You know, it's, um, it's something that you can forever aspire for. Um, and is that, it seems to me that that's the last thing we need in IP to tie ourselves up to goals that, have, that are very speculative, that have no benchmarking, that have no funds allocated towards it. Um, so yeah, so that's the sort of mix of this real right-based, rules-based model and a completely open-ended sort of governance um, structure. So, thank you. Um, a lot. There's a lot, right? Um, <laughs> but I mostly agree. So to start with the the last, uh, because that's the one that's top of mind, um, the SDGs as being open and perhaps not giving us too much direction. Um, I, I would say that the SDGs are open, but they're not so open, right? So each one of them has got targets. They're, they're targets, they're 169 indicators, states report regularly, there is a deadline, 2030. So that there is some fixation, that there is some certainty about what needs to be done. And I think what is attractive to me about the sustainable development goals is the point that Uma made earlier on about this is something where we have at least some global agreement, at least um, most states will say, yes, this is good. We want to make sure that we have a sustainable future. This is a blueprint for, for humanity. This is how we get out. So my take would be take that commitment um, and, and try and spin it and then say, well, if, if you as a state say you're committed uh, to this developmental goal, their targets, their indicators, well, one way to make it happen is to make sure your IP actually serves the purposes for which it was intended. So it's almost like taking the, the arguments or the global norm and then using it um, to further IP. Um, so that, that was the last point I think that you made that I wanted to, to go with. And then the point that you made earlier on about um, developing countries uh, are being it's a different playing field that we had in 99, 2000, where perhaps we had developing countries almost speaking with one voice. Um, here you've given a really good example of where you have developing countries almost breaking ranks and appearing with the other side. Um, it is what it is. Um, countries takes us back again to one of the points made by Uma about um, how much power do we think that uh, private industry actually holds? Um, I would bet that those states that seem to break ranks and perhaps side with what we could call the other side, um, that would be as a consequence of influence um, that's been wielded upon them by private right holders. Takes me back again to a point that I made earlier on um, about one of the things that Professor Cornish always stressed um, in his teaching um, about the policy uh, framing of intellectual property and also asking how much weight we should give to stakeholder representations, aka lobbying. So in states taking positions at negotiations or domestically, how much weight should they actually give? Um, again, going back to what Uma said, um, I think private right holders have a lot more power than we actually um, always um, appreciate. So I think that's one of the reasons um, that you find states taking um, positions that we didn't expect them to take. Um, I think those are the, the, the two things that are wrong. I mean, the first was, was really a comment with which I agree. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, uh, Uma yes. wants to, yes. Just add to that. Um, I just want to say, I find the CGs attractive for what you, the term you used, the, the what was it, global drum beating. Yeah. I mean, because there's so many international organizations working into IP. So I'm not looking at it from any other perspective except IP. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can even, never mind even the corporations, we can rein in the different organizations to go to one league. Because right now it's so disparate. Um, in relation to the differences in negotiations, I'm curious because I always used to look at negotiations not between developed countries and developing countries, but IP importers and IP exporters. So when it comes to copyright, India started going over and sitting with, you know, US. But in patterns, they sit on the other side. Uh, depending on which 
goods they are interested mm. in. Well, the interesting thing about India is that they're now an exporter mm. of pharmaceutical products and some of their own patented medicines to that to the extent that they are now playing mm. kind of a double game. And the Indian court for trade yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so, uh, mm. but, but that's a story, that's a story of development, isn't it? Yeah. Where you know, in the 1970s and 80s, India was not protecting pharmaceutical patents at all. It copied a lot, became a generics powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And over time, it yeah. became more and more innovative. And now it is changing its tune, both at the, as you say, at the, the courts level. Yeah. Um, if we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals, surely we need more examples like that. And, you know, Joseph Stieglitz warned in 1994, 30 years ago, that putting the majority of the world's countries into the same box of IP yeah. was going to hold back a lot of the developing countries. Um, whereas the model had always been, you know, you, you, you and China has followed this because it has the leverage to do so, you copy until you begin to export your own products and then you become a defender of IP, yeah. uh, not beforehand. But if there is one other question, we have time if anyone has thoughts. Um, Anyone who hasn't spoken yet? I know Graham oh. already has. Yes. <laughs> All right, Graham, go ahead. Um, well, actually, let's give it to Trevor since yeah. uh, Trevor hasn't spoken. Yeah. All right, I'll check. I, thank you very much, Caroline, and uh, for all the and and, and to uh, but um, I probably come at this from slightly the other side and uh, share a lot of Robin's views, but I think there is a more fundamental question which perhaps the discussions today almost distract from, and that is the whole question or a different aspect of relevance of intellectual property. And let's focus on the health space. And now, I have a different perspective of the private players in this. They are facing an existential crisis. They have decreasing productivity in terms of producing new drugs. The ten trends towards personalizing in one way or another medicines means that treatments become ridiculously uneconomic if they're to recover any sort of R&D expense. And you look at the R&D expenditure of the major pharmaceutical companies in the world, top 16, I think it was, the exercise was done last year. They have been spending more than they have any, or most of them have been spending more than they have any capacity to recover in terms of drug pricing. And what I wonder about, and what troubles me about this discussion, is that we may not be focusing on the right thing, because there may just not be the new medicines coming through and how do we make the IP system contribute to that? And I don't think we're having that discussion sufficiently. Yeah, uh, actually, that's a fair point. I mean, right now in the US Senate, they're beginning to have that discussion mm -hmm. because they're facing this crisis where with personalized medicine, medicine for one person costs $3 million. It might cure you of sickle cell anemia. So, so that means, um, that person's cured, so they're not going to need to buy any more of it. Um, but also, it's, it's so personal to that person that you can't scale it up. So this could also be the end of generic medicines, if, if it follows this path. So there are a whole load of, of huge challenges like that that, um, that do need to be discussed. Um, but there's also an element of, of, of this which is completely out of control. I mean, if you look at the projections for the amount the U.S. spends on healthcare, for example, it's going to bankrupt the country in about 20 or 30 years, you know. Um, but, it, it, sorry, yeah. the U.S. is a special case because half of that expenditure in the U.S. is just to intermediate rent seekers, insurance companies, pharmaceutical benefit manufacturers, all those 
well, you said you list for example. Example. It's not an example of anything else. It's <laughs> unique. Well, I, I, I raise it because it is unique, but it is also the market that most pharma con country companies tailor their approach to R&D and productivity to. So, you know, the, the, the craziness of the other factors, of what, which makes it such an inefficient uh, financialized market, mean that most of the investment goes into things that you can sell for the kind of crazy prices. That, so. It's, un it's completely unsustainable for, 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 for a lot of reasons that have nothing to do with IP. I completely agree with you there. But it is a problem for our pharmaceutical I industries that they are still looking to recoup money from a market that is completely unsustainable. So at a certain point, this is going to you know, come, come, come to, to a head. I, I agree with you. Caroline, do you want to make a final comment and then we'll, we'll sum up? So much to say. Um... So I, I think that this is a really um, important discussion and we've had like questions, comments about aspects that of course we're not able to cover um, in this one and a half hour setting. Um, so I think that the, the debates will no doubt continue um, and that uh, the only thing I can say about the, the pandemic accord uh, normative moment is that I am worried that uh, it will be lost again. Uh, as states circle around, you know, existing arguments and perhaps not branching out to discuss the things um, where perhaps the problem also lies in addition um, to where we seem to be stuck. Um, and so I think, so, yeah. So, so uh, as you say, the more things change, the more they stay the same, we remain <laughs> stuck. So, so on that note, I will ask you to thank Caroline for this wonderful session we've had, and also Uma, of course and invite you to the reception just outside the door. Um, so thank you once again.